Hello, and welcome back to Plantopia. Plantopia is the plant health podcast of the American Phytopathological Society, and I'm your host, Matt Casson. I'm an associate professor of forest pathology and mycology at West Virginia University. This is the eighth episode of season four of Plantopia, and today I'm talking with Dr. Jonathan Jacobs, who is an associate professor of emerging infectious disease ecology in the Department of Plant Pathology at The Ohio State University. Dr. Jacobs completed his BS at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, triple majoring in bacteriology, genetics, and Spanish, and completed a PhD at the same institution in plant pathology. He served as an NSF postdoc at IRD in France, then as a Fulbright scholar at the Université Catholique de Louvain in Belgium, and as a USDA NIFA postdoc at Colorado State University in Fort Collins. In 2018, he joined the faculty of the Department of Plant Pathology at The Ohio State University, where he is currently an associate professor. He is currently serving as a Fulbright Scholar in Uruguay at INIA. Dr. Jacobs is an award-winning researcher and mentor whose lab focuses primarily on bacterial blight and leaf spot pathogens. He's worked with Erwinia, Xanthomonas, Xylella, and Ralstonia. At OSU, he teaches courses in molecular plant microbe interactions, current topics in plant bacterial diseases, and a hypothesis-driven lab research course. Welcome, Jonathan. Thanks for having me. It's great to have you on. In preparing for this interview, it's hard not to notice how well-traveled you are. Wisconsin to France, France to Belgium, Belgium to Colorado, Colorado to Ohio, Ohio to Belgium, Belgium to Uruguay. It goes on and on and on. It seems to me like you have this travel bug, and I want you to talk a little bit more about it and maybe how it shaped your career thus far. That's an interesting question. I think that I have an interest personally for my work at International Ag, but that came from curiosity. Mm -hmm. I think I remember looking through an encyclopedia, trying to teach myself Japanese numbers. My grandma's from Okinawa. I think this curiosity of somewhere else that I didn't have access to in the U.S. Right, and that makes sense. So you grew up in, in Wisconsin? And... Yeah, I was born in Chicago, lived above my grandpa's bakery, and there's some funny connections to that now that I work on cereals and really connecting with the end users of grains. We moved to Wisconsin when I was about six and moving from the big city to a relatively small city on the border of Minnesota and Wisconsin. So maybe my accent will sound a little bit Minnesotan or Wisconsin. And then I went to school at University of Wisconsin. I triple majored in bacteriology, genetics, and Spanish. I didn't know what I wanted to do. And so sometimes I talk about how my brain is full of chaos and, and I couldn't choose. And I was taking classes in golden era Spanish literature while also taking bacterial genetics and never really wanted to separate those. I really liked the humanities and also science. And I stumbled upon a class, plant bacteriology, mm -hmm. with Caitlin Allen, who have actually ended up being my PhD advisor. And she has had research projects in... Latin America. And so after taking her course, I asked to have an undergrad research experience in her team. And I think the rest is history. And actually one of my main collaborators, Amilka Sanchez, who's a faculty member at Guatemala, is actually one of my collaborators now. Okay. He actually trained me to screen resistant germplasm to bacterial wilt. And now we're collaborators. So I think I had a bug early on and I made connections that let me explore the world more. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. I want to go back a little bit, triple majored, and, and obviously that's impressive. If you talk to people that are undecided about what they want to do, they don't usually triple major. They usually pick one and, and maybe falter in that major. Do you think there was an advantage to studying Spanish and you know, your genetics and bacteriology? Do you think that majoring in Spanish certainly helped with your collaborations in Spanish-speaking countries, if you weren't fluent in Spanish already, but do you think just studying something outside of science really helped shape your perspective on science? Yeah, I don't have the exact answer to this, but 
and maybe you can understand this, our job is also communication. Mm -hmm. And I had to write term papers about Spanish literature or Latin American culture regularly. And that really taught me how to communicate. I used to not be able to read out loud growing up. So it was wild that I was getting training in another language. And then I could bring those skills back into science because I wasn't really paying attention when I started my PhD, but you have to write a whole book. And so I think if I knew that from the beginning, I might have stayed away from the discipline, but always working adjacent, building these skills and communication really helped me loop back into the science where a lot of my job is speaking out loud. And I never could imagine that I could give a talk in front of people now. I would get C's in speech class. Yeah. I was a bad student. I couldn't give talks out loud. And I, I had a great advisor who also majored in English. So Caitlin had majored in English. And I think she knew how to wield some of that chaotic brain. I see some interesting parallels between leaping in headfirst to learn a new language and leaping into a, a research project. Because it's like a lot can go wrong. Yet when I look at your CV, I see these what were great opportunities to grow as a researcher and as a human. You major in Spanish, yet your first postdoc is in France. So I'm guessing you had to learn French too, or at least learn some French. So that's also risk-taking, but risk-taking that's going to benefit you in the long term. And that kind of leap to learn a language is no different in my eyes as the leap to tackle a really complex research question. Yeah, I think two things came to mind with that. So one, diving in and learning a new language definitely kept me rooted going to France after I was a newly minted PhD. And that one of my hobbies is swing dancing. And so I had a large community of people that I didn't, I wasn't proficient in French, but I could still communicate through dance or enjoying music, going out and listening to live jazz. And I remember one of my friends looked at me and he, he said, you have your PhD because I couldn't communicate. And I remember thinking, being offended, I don't talk stupid. I am not stupid, but it, it definitely kept me grounded because I had just finished a high level degree and then I had to start over. Diving into science, I think is similar. You have to let go a little bit to let the creativity happen, to try to find what inspires you. Mm -hmm. But that might not work for everybody. Actually, my best colleagues are those that are rigid and I don't want to say square in a negative way, yeah. but they, my closest colleagues like boundaries. And so we really collaborate excellently together. I wouldn't say that's probably the route for everybody. It works for me, but it's also complimentary to people that are not like you at all. And we'll get to this in a little bit, but this kind of is the first glimpse and, and mentioned what we're talking about, about being and the, the thought processes involved with being ADHD. Like I have ADHD and I've been very forthright about that. And I know that you've said that you are too. And I think that really frames how we see the world and how we see information and how we absorb information. So what may seem like chaos to people around us is actually just a nonlinear thought processes that help us be part of the world around us. Yeah, I joke that I thrive in the chaos. Yeah. <laughs> to stay on the topic of travel and how it shaped your career, certainly traveling is a privilege and it costs money and time and you lose progress or you lose momentum every time you have to pick up. And there's a lot that's been said about how the academic system itself is broken because you have to move every two years and prove that you're able to pick up and start over and you have to have the financial independence to do all this stuff. I could go on and on. But you had some help in sense that you were a Fulbright scholar and that's something that's competitive and you apply for. Do you want to talk a little bit about what inspired you to apply for that first Fulbright? Maybe it was your advisor and how has those experiences, and I'm talking to you now from your second Fulbright, how has the Fulbright program kind of shaped you as a scientist? Yeah. So maybe I can comment on something how APS directly impacted me here. So I think I was one of the first, if not the first Tarleton awardee, which let me go to Reunion Island, which is a small territory off the coast of France. And so mm -hmm. APS really 
let me take some of those first steps in graduate school. Okay. And I think that's something really beautiful in our society is that it is international and there are opportunities for graduate students to get funding to pursue those activities. And I applied to Fulbright for a couple of reasons. I wanted to continue my research experience in Europe. So I had gone to Europe, was there for three years in, in the south of France at the Institute for Research and Development in Montpellier. And I wanted to learn from another research system. And Belgium is, I would say, the bridge between the American system and, and the European French system. Yeah, I'm glad you I'm glad you said that because I was wondering why Belgium. I didn't know what the connection was, but that makes sense. Yeah, and I was developing projects around a re-emerging disease called bacterial leaf streak. It is never going to be as important as head blight in cereals, but some of the foundational work that was done on this system was performed in Louvain-le-Neuve, which is right outside of Brussels. And so I reached out. My postdoc advisor in France made a connection to my colleague Claude Bogart, and he said, I would support your Fulbright experience. And it was a way to learn from an expert who had really set foundational work in the 1990s, early 2000s in this space. And I was able to learn directly from him. And the field had somewhat died out. And then it's currently a pretty important problem in North America from even Canada is investing quite a bit of resources to work on this. So I had a fortunate opportunity to train with the person that was the expert in this space that became, again, a problem in the United States. Actually, a fun fact is the first report of Xanthomonas translucens that causes bacterial leaf streak was in science in the early 1900s. And it's exciting to be part of that legacy and to have this Fulbright opportunity to learn from somebody who actually he works now on viruses but i got to learn from the person who redeveloped the field since the early 1900s that's great and i guess there's a lesson to be learned there is if a scientist inspires you and they're still active shoot your shot in that regard reach out to them and say look i would love to work with you i'd love for you to teach me the things that you know because there's all this knowledge that sometimes isn't passed on. Unfortunately, we see this with older emeritus faculty who just have so much knowledge and it, there's no passing of the torch to the next generation. And all this unpublished data, this unique insight is lost. But by working with someone like that, you can carry those really refined ideas forward. Yeah, I reflect regularly about a generation of scientists who were trained in the 80s and early 90s who have really impacted plant health research, participated in APS leadership, and have really shaped the field now. And I've been lucky to learn from some of them. I, I have to say that generation set us up for success and made this field important. So I moved back from France to the United States Thankfully, having funding from USDA NIFA on another fellowship, rolling the dice, because you never know if you're going to get those funds, to work with Jan Leach, former mm -hmm. president, um, real leader in the space of plant bacterial interactions, rice resistance, durable rice resistance, and to be able to work with the person that created the term phytobiome. Right. And so it's curious to think about where our generation of scientists will bring the field and also the ones we're training now, right? It, you can see the impact that some of those individuals have made. And they're at every one of our universities or government industry, right? Yeah. It's funny. I often come across that meme of a, a car going to pull in a spot and it's like about academic research. It's like brand new idea. And then there's a, like a small sports car. And it's some guy in the 80s idea. And it's, it speaks to this. There's a lot of great discoveries that have been made and there's a lot of people to learn from, but so often we overlook some of these discoveries or we rediscover them only to realize in the dusty books and literature that they're, it's there. The idea that comes to mind with the example you gave, and maybe it's not a direct parallel, was I was on a field trip in the Philippines with Jan. We were surveying rice production, and we just started chatting about an idea that we had that 
maybe I could pursue in her team. And so those things could happen on a bar or on a bus doing field work. Right. So you're currently in, in Uruguay, right? Yes. What are you doing there? What kind of research are you doing there? And, and tell me a little bit about it. Yeah. So I'm working at India, which I think the translation would be the National Institute for Agricultural and Fisheries Investigation. Mm -hmm. And here they have some really important work around cereal health and some long-term studies that relate to resistance to fusarium head blight. And they've seen recently bacterial leaf streak emerge as a problem. I'll be working here with my colleague who's a researcher at INIA, Silvia Pereira, who is the first PhD student, actually my collaborator at University of Minnesota, Ruth Dill Mackey. It, our world is so small. Right. And I, I also get the opportunity, so I'm spending two months here in Colonia de Sacramento, and then in the spring, I'll be in Montevideo working at UDELAR, which is one of the main universities, and I'll be able to engage more within a university setting. So first will be a lot of research, participating in field days. I'm definitely stressed about doing that, presenting <laughs> bacterial leaf streak in Spanish, cereal production. I'm going to have to practice, even though I don't like practicing, presenting. And then in the spring, I'll actually be able to teach. And, and I'm really excited about that, is that I get to have both connections to a university system and then the USDA equivalent here. And is there a break in between or is it continuous? Yeah, I'll come back between from December and January for the holidays. Okay. That makes sense. I'll miss the summer, unfortunately, here and return to winter. I also note that you served as a visiting assistant professor in Belgium from 2017 to 2023. I, I, obviously, that was concurrent with your appointment at OSU, correct? Yeah. So I... I'm a shy extrovert, and I think that's the simplest way to describe this. I like deep and few connections. I have a hard time with small talk. Like if someone comes up to me at a meeting, I am in general shy if I don't know you. I may not be perceived as friendly. Like it, it just isn't the case though. It's just I have a small, close friend network, but I'm very outgoing with them. And I think the same goes for my research is that I have a handful of really important connections, and they're not ephemeral. They're long-term and deep connections. And so I still continue training students from Belgium, or I started and now continue. I also give courses on plant bacteriology. It's been great to host students and give back. The same has happened with my experiences at IRD in the south of France. At my second PhD student, that's hard to say, second or third, because they defended the same day. I met actually at IRD. So it's nice to have these deeply rooted connections to these places to give back to the education that really supported me. So I'm hoping the same can happen here to create connections to train students or send my trainees down here to learn about research done in South America. That makes sense. I really commend you on that. I haven't done much international work. I've traveled internationally for personal travel. And I collaborate with scientists in Chile and, and other places that work on things together, but we haven't visited each other. And I know in some ways that presents fewer opportunities for my own students and mentees to travel. So I can appreciate what you're doing there. And, and it's also clear that you've learned from your mentors how to do that and provide these kind of important networks that allow your students and trainees, postdocs, to have these international experiences. Yeah, I'd see this as an opportunity to build positively across borders because that's one thing about Fulbright. It's a form of soft diplomacy. So Senator Fulbright, I think his name was, participated in selling off U.S. arms that created Fulbright. And then we represent the government in a positive way although we're not government employees, but these, this is a form of soft diplomacy that we positively engage with research here and build connections because those are really powerful. And I think writing a project around food, I did have to get specific in the science, but really leading hard in everybody needs to eat. Everybody experiences plants in some way. 
I had written in part of my narrative that I just remember the first time ever being in Uruguay when I made this connection is just driving along the road and seeing local cheese stands, which really reminded me of my state is connected to dairy, that this community here is rooted in agriculture. And so seeing small cheese producers thought, wow, this, this would be like an incredible place to experience. Yeah, I, I agree with you there. Obviously, food security is a global issue. And the more international work you do and the more international connections, maybe the bigger teams you can develop and, and solve some really pressing problems. It's nice to have all those people contributing to solve some of our greatest problems on the planet, which include food security. So with these collaborations and, and travel, you're in Uruguay now, and I'm sure you've traveled back to Belgium, maybe during 2017 through 2023, but there are extended periods of time when you're away from OSU. How do you manage that? I look at, you successfully graduated three PhD students in 2024. You have four additional grad students, two undergrads, four postdocs. You have an army. And I know militaries and armies are structured in a way where there's group leaders and there's, there's a general, there's the officers under that general. Do you want to talk a little bit about how you manage such a big group, especially when there's travel involved? I am really lucky to have high achieving, successful people that come from everywhere, every background. And one thing I lead you right away when I'm interviewing is that we're an interconnected team. I think we all know the downsides of the pandemic, but one positive was that we had to depend on each other. It was essential. And so Nobody in my team is an island. It's highly integrated. There are instances where I have to top down, lead the lab, but maybe this is like a hill and everybody brings high value, even the undergrads. I think they are so core to my team and lead some of the powerful innovation. Their curiosity may be like mine was when I was an undergrad isn't influenced by major concepts in the discipline. They're just eager to soak up whatever they can from whoever's advising them in the lab or even me. And so I think that being highly integrated has been essential to this where maybe a grad student doesn't only report to me. We do meet weekly, but maybe they also report to a postdoc. Mm -hmm. We also have small groups that the students actually drive. I don't touch this or the postdocs where they have thematic groups where they meet weekly around bioinformatics, phenotyping, experimental design, and I'm pretty independent of that. And so they meet together as a community to look at their work together. And so that's largely unmanaged by me. And so I'm, I think empowering them to lead small groups within the team helps them have accountability to continue work forward and find community with each other. Yeah, I would agree with everything you said. I run my lab the same way. It's not quite as big where you have this integrative group and everybody supports everybody else. And you do have a hierarchical system where undergrad is under a grad student who is also advised a little bit by a postdoc, but you meet with them regularly too. It's clear that you take your role as mentor quite seriously. You were a 2024 OSU Postdoctoral Faculty Mentor of the Year Award recipient. You also received the OS Drake Teaching Award. Your dedication to mentorship is written on your CV in that regard. You don't get those awards by self-nominating. You don't get those awards by slacking off. So it's clear that you take that role very seriously. And when I look at the awards that your mentees have received, it's clear that you're training them in a way that they're also receiving these kinds of awards. Do you want to speak to your mentoring style outside of what we've already talked about and some of the challenges or some of the great things about mentoring, whatever you'd like. I'm just thinking like, obviously it's clear that it's essential to who you are is how you connect with your lab members. Yeah. I think mentoring, advising, coaching, whatever hat you're wearing is hard and it's a lot of work and you have to invest in people and build relationships. I think one of my weaknesses is that I'm scattered. And so for new people, it, it can be a challenge to work with me, but I've created structure around that to really help me succeed with some clear lab policies, resources, 
also getting feedback from other colleagues. One of my colleagues, Tiffany Low Power at the UC Davis. I know Tiffany. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So she is a great example of how to be direct with empathy. And I learned a lot from her and she shared a resource called the book called Radical Candor. And I highly recommend for folks to read this. Like, and I highly recommend people to read this book. We have a hard job where we're trying to get students to grow. And then we also have, whether it's your stakeholder or your grant deadline or a publication, some bottom line that you have to hit. And so mm-hmm. how do you balance your trainees need with also have to achieving a goal? And it's sometimes impossible. <laughs> But I think it's best to deflect on the trainees' support than the science. Before we jumped on, I had mentioned that faculty, we have endless responsibility. And I think anybody in our level of work can agree that we have so increasing demands and not enough time. But having this understanding that those are the barriers, I didn't understand that until I arrived into this role. I, if I could communicate to people that this job is hard, but it enriched my life and it still does. It continues to do that. And I also think it helps. I've become more understanding because I can't achieve everything and probably my student can't either. Right. Mm -hmm. So I think that keeps you grounded, but that book was really powerful for me to read because I think I sometimes fall into these other two categories. She called the books called radical candor and that's, like giving direct feedback with empathy. But there are other two directions, which is ruinous empathy. And I think sometimes we fall into that category because we really want to empower people, but don't always give them the resources to succeed, or maybe it's not the right fit. The other end is they call obnoxious aggression. It is not that intense. It's just more giving direct feedback. And scientists, we fall in that category. Maybe you don't always get an A. Today, you got a 30%. Yeah. I'm like, like a pushover. And so for me, the idea of giving student like negative feedback like that or an F is the most stressful thing in my life. I actually don't ever want to do that. Yeah. So I think it's really hard work to be a good advisor and balancing this direct feedback with empathy that really supports their vision for their career. On the topic of mentoring, one of the things that you had communicated to me before this interview was that you foster a very inclusive environment especially for people with disabilities. And you yourself spent 10 years with limited right arm mobility, according to what you said. Do you want to talk about how that shaped the way that you view other people? And I think it's an important topic. I want to give you the space to talk about it if you want to. Yeah. So for about 10 years, I couldn't use my right arm properly and you couldn't see it because I could use it for regular stuff. But couldn't lift a heavy object. And if I did, it was like, I would feel the pain for days. And so then my arm eventually got weaker. I cannot use my arm properly unless I go to physical therapy every week. And really grateful, shout out to the physical therapists at OSU have really helped me recover. But it's funny, I have two people that joined my team without knowing that about me that have limited use of their hands. And so I don't believe in fate, but it is wild that people came to my team that needed increased access. I also think this is a community that is largely overlooked. I think we rarely talk about them in the discussion of diversity and they've communicated that directly to me. I haven't dealt with this my whole life. They have, right? So they have their whole identity shaped in some way from this, where I was an adult already. I had Mm -hmm. childhood, it's a limited adulthood that I could use my right arm. And it brings from some really incredible discussions. It's also increased our ability to recruit students and make sure there's access for them if they have access issues. And one thing is if my training needs something, I will go for it hard to try to find that resource. Yeah, You know, it goes back to this interconnectedness And I've learned quite a bit from them too and their experience. So I would say we're, I've only been a PI for 
six years. And so I'll be curious how we shape this together as it builds. But I do find it fascinating that two of my trainees have limited use of their hands and they just landed in my lab. It's invisible. Nobody can see. I don't even talk about it. I actually started talking about it because of them, because it was a way we connected. Well, I'm a firm believer that you don't say you're an inclusive lab. You just are one and people notice it. It's like the ally statement. Like allyship is not something to sign by the person who is the ally. It's assigned by the people that you're being an ally for. So I've noticed that in my lab that there's a lot of people that struggle with mental health. And of course, a lot of people do because academia has a lot of that. But I noticed too that it's a disproportionate amount and might see in the, the lab next door or a lab across campus. We have challenges ahead with that. Unfortunately, we're not the experts in those issues, but we actually do need support because we have trainees that are open about what they're dealing with and have these needs. And so we're unfortunately in the phase where we haven't solved any of those problems, but those high needs need support. And so I really hope the universities step up to support us here because I think they're also learning to navigate it. Yeah. And I've definitely seen this as an instructor. There's a, a number of of more students that are getting accommodations through the official office through the WVU. And that's good because they're recognized as having a need for an accommodation and we're able to provide them that. But I tell my students, look, not everything is diagnosed. If you feel that you need more time because you just need it, just ask me. As long as you communicate these things to me, then I can help you. But I can't help you if I don't know and I also know that I'm no substitute for a, a healthcare professional, but I want to provide guidance to you based on my experiences. I'd like to come back to the, the disability thing. I tore my hip labrum back in December of last year, and I had to get surgery to repair it. And I was on crutches for about 45 days from early April till the end of May. And boy, did that open my eyes about how buildings are laid out, how unaccommodating a lot of the infrastructure is, how elevators just randomly stop working, because I had no weight bearing for 45 days, which was pretty excruciating. But it doesn't compare to someone who has a lifelong disability, but it opened my eyes and and gave me a, a new perspective on just the lived experiences of people that deal with mobility issues on a temporary an intermittent or regular basis. And I thought, wow, it takes so much of your bandwidth just to deal with that. And then you're trying to work 40 hours a week and do all that. You can see where it becomes increasingly challenging. I think the lens of connecting with people is really powerful here to see potentially their experience or going back to travel. I can't carry a bag through the airport. And I remember when I asked to check it, there was something wrong with my file. And the person was like, can't you just carry it? And I remember almost exploding. I had to pull back because it was something that I didn't think about until that moment that I never carry a bag through the airport. I have to check a bag. And that's a part of my average life. But it's like taking the elevator, right? Because I travel a lot. Yeah. So uh, I'm going to pivot a little bit because obviously there's a lot of exciting research that you do. And there's some things that you had mentioned to me previously. Talk a little bit about climate resilience and and specialty crops and plant health. And you said you were working on a review on this and and how we're really so far behind in adapting to a changing world or trying to keep up with a changing climate. Do you want to talk about your lab or or some of the stuff you're doing and maybe contributing to helping to lessen that gap or just some insight that might be useful to our listeners? Yeah. So I have not worked in the climate space And I would say I'm not a climate agricultural scientist, but I think we all need to be focusing on this topic. It feels now and also really far away. We're constantly dealing with immediate problems too. And I've been fortunate to be advised or trained or engage with folks from that era, 80s, early 90s scientists that are deeply invested in this topic. And Sally Miller, who recently retired from our university, was our vegetable pathologist. She and a few other colleagues in our department, Anna Teston, USDA researcher, Melanie Lewis-Ivy, 
our fruit pathologist, Francesco Rotunda, our diagnostician, this was on the forefront of their mind. And, and Sally included me in writing this commentary that we wrote for APS Press and came to realize there's just no resilience in our crops for high temperature. Most resistance breaks down. And at the molecular level, now the bioengineering is really happening. We're not ready for that. And when I had to make the parallel, we had to cite research in rice. So the gene that's required for that XA7 was recently cloned by colleagues in Missouri, Bing Yang's group, and also a group in China. I, I cannot remember the first author on that publication, but my postdoc advisor, Jan Leach, had worked on that for a lot of her career, and it was a really durable rice resistance gene. And mm -hmm. high temperatures are going to threaten rice production, but also for Ohio producers where I work now. And so we came together as a group and wrote this commentary and just realized the resources are just not there. And then at the same time, I started collaborating with a few researchers that are interested in climate microbiology, one including Cindy Morris, who, among others, participated in the discovery of ice nucleation being important for precipitation. Mm -hmm. And I went to a polar conference and hearing from scientists that have nothing to do with agriculture really showed me the need for us to have these interdisciplinary connections. I don't know where this is going to head. I think it connects to one of your previous guests, Nick Grunwald said preparedness, right? Mm -hmm. One of the speakers from the APS meeting was around that. And we have to have this framework of preparedness and we're not ready. And models predict that the polar ice, at least in the summer, is going to be melted. There's going to be no polar ice in summers by 2050. There's like a range, 2030 to 2050. That's not far. So we give a lot of lip service to climate change, but we don't have the solutions yet. But there are pioneers out there. I don't know about my lab's role. I'm hoping to build in that direction now. And we're starting to do work in ice nucleation, but I don't want to sound the alarms that we're in trouble, but I think that there's significant investment that needs to head towards interdisciplinary work, bringing in physicists, bringing in polar scientists that connect with people that directly engage with producers. Yeah. I agree. As we're speaking, a major hurricane is pushing up the Southeast United States. And by all accounts, it's bigger and more severe than previous storms. And they're predicting flooding that hasn't been seen in a century. And it speaks to this chaotic weather patterns where we're seeing more intense storm surge. And that has profound effects on coastal ecosystems, plant health in terms of natural environments. I think about these things a lot, not only because I think about the role that fungi play in forming mutualistic partnerships with plants, but working in the higher elevations of the central Appalachian mountains here in the Eastern United States, we have these sky islands of spruce that only occur at the highest elevations above 4,000 feet. And they have nowhere to go. If it gets warmer, it's not going to be suitable habitat for them. They disappear. And all the microbes that you have co-evolved in these ecosystems, they, they all go. And we've seen interesting plant-fungal interactions happening in these. And people will often ask, why are they appearing now? We've never reported them there before. Plants are uniquely stressed across this planet because of climate change. And we can't predict how things are going to play out. All we can do is build in some of these kinds of tools that could help lessen that gap. But you're right, we're behind. Yeah, everybody should go experience the red spruce in West Virginia. I think I'm not very spiritual, but if there's a spirit of the forest, which I'm very careful of talking about things as a scientist, but I imagine something. It lives in the Monongahela forest by those red spruce. Yeah. And you spent time there. Oh, a lot of time. I like to hike with my dogs and it's one of the most beautiful places on earth. I think it's interesting how preserved it is with so much industrial development and suffering in that state, but people value their land there because that's what they have. Well, people feel more connected to the land. Yeah, and it's one of the most gorgeous forests. And I've lived in Colorado, I've lived in a lot of places, and I find it to be one of the most gorgeous forests I've ever experienced in my life. 
Oh, well, that's nice to hear. I'm not a native of West Virginia. I'm from Pennsylvania, but I know how proud people that are, are born here and how much pride they have in the kind of natural resources that are here. So yeah, it's scary, but it's not unsolvable given the right investment and the right collective push to get things done. I feel we talk about like, how do we build resiliency into the landscape and make more resilient crops? And, and obviously there's lots of people doing work in this area, but I agree that there's this disconnect between climatologists and we should be attending more of those meetings and they should be attending more of ours. Granted, we don't have the uh, thousands of dollars to register for big meetings every year, but we learned a lot from the pandemic. And one of those things is we can be connected remotely through Zoom and we can have meetings without having to travel necessarily. So there are ways to connect without having to actually physically travel. Yeah. These are powerful connections to be making, whether it's with some forest ecosystem or maybe the end user of the crop that you work on. Speaking of a COVID pandemic thing is I really invested in bread making and mm -hmm. my grandfather was a baker. My great grandfather was a baker and I've been able to develop this skill and actually connect with local millers in Columbus. The company's actually called local millers and a local pizza shop. One of my best friends owns a pizza shop in town. So he lets me use the spent oven, but they're confronted by limitations of plant disease too. So this doesn't connect to climate change, but really engaging with people outside of where we're at and they're suffering at some end of the production system from plant disease. And in their case, it's often with cereals, head blight, fungal toxins. And so there is high value to our work. And I think that's maybe a part of our success is we can connect to the real world, right? It's not too far. I can connect to a local miller, whether it's from my passion for making bread, using their flour or supporting resistance screening for a cereal company breeder, right? Mm. I think that's something, a strength of plant pathology where we can build connections across scales. Right. And I say this all the time. Everyone has a plant question. I go to my parents' house and the neighbor's like, hey, something's killing my tree. What is it? Or what is this plant? People have a curiosity about plants. And it's clear that you understand the importance of outreach. And, and I don't mean in reach, like where you're just talking to the scientist of actually connecting with the end user. And I've always said this, and I'll say it till I die, is that you have to meet people where they are. And no member of the general public, minus a few, are going to have a thermal cycler in their kitchen. But they're going to have a mold-covered loaf of bread that they bought at the farmer's market, forgot about, and now it's covered in penicillium. You can use that as a vehicle to educate them on fungal biology and ecology and understanding how they're connected to the grains and, and how we're connected to what's happening on their countertops. So it's like it's meeting them where they are so that they can understand what you do, see the value in it, and feel like they want to invest in it. Like we talk about buy-in from the general public. They don't want to buy in unless they understand it. And they're not going to understand it if you just go around speaking over their heads and using technical jargon. You have to connect with them over a loaf of bread. Yeah, this is really why it's one of our strengths is extension and outreach and our extension pathologists keep us rooted and they're the direct connection to those communities and, and they're the ones metaphorically breaking bread with the farmer. And so I think that there's a place for us in the future here with that. And it clearly is through connecting with people. Yeah, we're running out of time, but I wanted to give you an opportunity to tell me or tell our listeners about maybe some exciting project that you're currently working on or you're just starting that, that scratches your brain every night as you fall asleep to something that you have going on in the lab that you'd like to share? Yeah, I think for me, I have many projects that I like. Yeah. I think that if you look at my publication record, I stepped away from bacterial genetics and shifted towards surveillance and trying to have a tools adapted for plant pathogen tracking and diagnostics and also training the students to do that. But I think we're in an exciting moment where we can attach a single gene to its function for an outbreak in real time. And I think we're at the cusp of this moment to respond. And so I'm so excited about that happening mm -hmm. in real time. 
And so this really takes developing deep relationships with industry and stakeholders, building trust so that they will let you use their resources and that you give them access to yours. Mm -hmm. And I'm really excited to see this next generation push that forward. And a couple examples are actually my former postdoc, Veronica Ruandreina, who's at Penn State now, is really leading the way using microbiome science as a surveillance tool and seeing her connect microbiome function all the way to what makes an outbreak happen. This has been really exciting to watch the evolution of a pathogen happen real time in the microbiome and add a functional understanding to that outbreak. Yeah. Obviously, there's a lot of people that are working in parts of that space. But if I'm reading your CV right and I'm, I'm listening to you talk, you're the kind of researcher that has a well-rounded background enough to be involved with all the different facets or as many as possible. And that way, you can better solve the problem if you understand everything from the single gene and the genetics down to what's the end user barriers. And I think a lot of people don't get the opportunity to put all those pieces together until a publication comes out and you have your many authors contributing their piece. But it sounds to me like you're mentoring students to understand and be involved with more of those pieces so they can have kind of a more well-rounded view of the, the issue at hand. Is that fair to say? Yeah, and I think this happens at multiple levels where one, I had a student that was very invested in the social science aspects of plant disease research. And so getting farmer perception of this translation of the knowledge to them. And so we haven't published this yet, but actually, if you have a genetic understanding, how does that change your perception of plant disease control or would you implement changes? So I've had to work with social scientists on this topic. I'm terrible at epidemiology, like quantitative epidemiology. I shouldn't say that out loud because maybe it'll get me rejected from a grant, but I lean on those experts that are math driven. And I had to take coursework in that or a field course in plant pathology. And so if you have this broad training, it will set you up for success in that way, right? Maybe sprinkle a little curiosity on there. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. I agree. We're out of time, but it's been wonderful talking with you. Thanks for taking time out of your schedule since you are in Uruguay traveling for your Fulbright. Appreciate you setting aside some time to talk with us here at Plantopia. Thanks so much for joining us. Thanks for hosting. We've just heard from Dr. Jonathan Jacobs, Associate Professor of Emerging Infectious Disease Ecology in the Department of Plant Pathology at The Ohio State University in Columbus. He joined us from Uruguay, where he's currently a Fulbright Fellow. As always, be sure to check the show notes section immediately following the episode description for links related to his work. I'm Matt Casson, host of Plantopia. Thanks for listening.